Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from today. Welcome to today's webinar from Revolution to Evolution, the new mobile biometric landscape. My name is Peter O'Neill and I am the president of Fine Biometrics and Mobile ID World. We have a very special webinar for you today and a record-setting attendance over 500 global participants. This echoes the kind of interest we are seeing across the board. For example, we have just returned from Barcelona and the Mobile World Congress. And I am pleased to report that identity and biometrics were very present at this year's show. Our editorial team was running flat out covering all the important identity news coming from Barcelona, including two interviews with the great folks from the GSMA. What a time for our industry. Biometrics and identity play an important role in so many innovative areas like IoT, robotics, connected living, autonomous vehicles, not to mention payments, fintech, and healthcare. Mobility is at the center of all of this. And it's not just at the Mobile World Congress that this escalation is happening. At leading vertical market conferences like Money 2020 for FinTech, HIMSS for Healthcare, and ISC for West for Physical Access, identity and biometrics are rapidly growing both on the show floors and in the sessions. Actually, we'll be reporting live from the ISC conference next week in Vegas. Challenges also arise when an industry experiences the kind of rapid growth that is happening now. It is very good to see groups like One World Identity and their No ID conference this May gathering the top global identity experts to discuss identity across all vertical markets. I'll be there discussing physical, mobile, digital, and logical security as they convene in the, in, the, uh, in the enterprise globally. And in a separate panel, I'll be discussing convenience, security, and the next step for biometrics. If you are in the identity business, this show should be on your hot list. There's so much going on. Be sure to stay on top of all this breaking news by visiting Fine Biometrics and our sister site, Mobile ID World. We're now in our 15th year covering markets like no one else, with in-depth articles, insights, the largest yearly review of our industry, featured theme months, newsletters, interviews with leaders in this space, and of course, our now famous webinar series. And this month, all month long, we have been focusing on the new mobile biometric landscape. And we have a lot to cover, so I'm going to jump right in. Please note to the attendees, to ask a question, just type it into the dialog box in your go to control panel on the right side of your screens. And please do this at any time. Don't wait until the end, as this will give us an opportunity to manage your questions. And we'll do our best to answer as many as possible at the end. And there will be lots, given the number of attendees today. This webinar will last about 15 minutes in total and will be recorded and available at findbiometrics.com. I would now like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors for their continuing support, Precise Biometrics, Aware Inc., and Knock Knock Labs, and a special thanks to Acuity Market Intelligence and the GSMA. And to start off our discussions today, I am so pleased that David Paulington is able to join us today from London. I had a chance to interview David at the Innovation City at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona about the tremendous work being done with Mobile Connect. And I knew that our base would love to get an up update, and David has kindly offered to provide us with one. David is the head of Applications and Services GSMA. Take it away, David. Thank you very much, Peter, and, and hello to everybody. Um, so my name is David Pollington. I work at uh, the trade body for the mobile operators worldwide. It's the GSM Association. Uh, the GSM Association is also the, the body behind such big events as Mobile World Congress that Peter was talking about. 
but this year um, attracted just shy of 110,000 delegates, so it's, uh, it's a huge event. So I'm just going to say a few words about um, an initiative that we have within the GSMA with the operator community worldwide um, called Mobile Connect. Essentially, Mobile Connect um, is tackling the issue that is increasingly uh, pervasive these days around data breaches and fragility of uh, passwords and basically the way that people authenticate themselves and authorize transactions online. The idea is to use your, your mobile phone, a device that you have with you all the time. It's a connected device. Um, it has processor. It has secure storage. It's an ideal vehicle through which you can uh, authenticate yourself using biometrics or other authentication modes, depending on your choice, and really increase the security of how you um, access online services, but without sacrificing convenience. So it's really about trying to get those two things in balance. And what we found is that um, talking to consumers directly and through online service providers, there's a real need, there's a real cry out from the public to, to solve this issue around uh, usernames and passwords and having to um, use different mechanisms for trying to um, securely authenticate to online services. If we go to the next one, Peter. So Mobile Connect at its core is all about authenticating the user, um, but it's also um, a framework through which there are an, a range of different identity services that can be provided. And this ranges from the basic authentication through the high security authentication and non-repudiation where it's important to understand exactly who the individual was. And um, through to actually asserting the identity of the individual uh, and potentially providing information that can be used at the fulfillment stage within a, an online service to more easily register a customer to a new merchant or to fulfill um, a checkout process. The other thing which is linked into to Mobile Connect and, and utilizes the capabilities of the, the mobile networks is really around providing more insights in terms of the way that the mobile device is being used to access online services, and this can be quite beneficial in terms of anti-fraud measures to be able to try and pinpoint and mitigate any kind of uh, attacks. So Mobile Connect is something that we're actively engaged talking to a range of um, um, companies worldwide. You can see there on the left a number of the different um, global service providers that we're already um, engaged with, um, and a range of different use cases there in the center that I, I won't go through in depth um, just at the moment. We just go to the next one, Peter. Um, so Mobile Connect sort of started um, humble beginnings a couple of years ago, um, and gradually it's been expanding in terms of its reach as more operators and more mobile operators have come on board. We now have an addressable market, I think, of around 3 billion um, users, and we're seeing the, the number of registered users skyrocketing over the past sort of six to 12 months. Um, and the number of active uh, monthly users are also increasing. So this is really a framework that um, is now starting to, to really get traction. One of the key things with Mobile Connect is that it has a pluggable approach. Um, so we're actively embracing um, biometrics um, and other industry standards such as FIDO to provide a coherent and comprehensive identity services framework that is, uses open standards uh, and is accessible um, by everyone. Okay, so that gives you a very quick sort of run through, five minute run through of Mobile Connect. Um, I'll pass this one now back to Peter. Yeah, thank you very much, David. The numbers are staggering, three billion. It's just, you know, when I when I see that chart, I just it's 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 quite incredible. So uh, hats off to the to the GSMA and you folks for getting this initiative underway. Um, and, and now we are very, uh, again, uh, very fortunate to have with us none other than the industry's brightest, boldest, and best analyst and consultant, Maxine Most. Max is the principal of Acuity Market Intelligence. And I've known Max well for about 15 years, and she has actually predicted this uh, mobile biometric evolution we are seeing right now. I remember Max talking about all of this about 10 years ago. Max will now be providing us with her latest thinking. I am so pleased to introduce the mighty Maxine Most. Take it away, Max. Thanks, Peter. As I said before, I, I think I should have Peter walk around and introduce me every place I go. 
Um, I want to basically provide a bit of a framework here for thinking about where I think mobile biometrics is going, and I think it's very interesting relative to the slides David showed you. So essentially where we are right now is we are in a world where this proliferation of smart mobile devices has already fundamentally created a global platform, you know, for communication, commerce, information access, all of that. And um, what's really interesting about it is because it is centered around our personal and mobile devices, it has essentially put consumers, you could also argue, you could use the word citizens here, at the center of this world of connected, uh, quote unquote, intelligence. And this is really changing the world for all of us. And it's interesting, um, if you look at the evolution of the marketplace, and this kind of uh, dovetails up what David talked about, this is, this is basically all smart mobile devices. These are projections that I've basically taken from multiple sources and aggregated. And what's interesting is I just read today that the 2016 numbers came out for smartphones, um, and it was one and a half billion units, and that's what this chart is showing, and this was done um, two years ago, three years ago now. So we're right on track for this kind of massive um, deployment of smart mobile devices. If you look at this by 2020 projecting, we're projecting almost three billion a year. And what's interesting about this platform is that because we have this complex platform, because we have billions of people out there in this network, we need a more reliable and, and complex mean of, means of identifying and, and authenticating to perform transactions. As we know, the risk of our transactions is increasing. Uh, we're seeing more and more fraud. And essentially, what we've seen happen is we've moved from this model of approximations of identity, um, these various tokens we have, to something that is more comprehensive and more reliable, which is our biometrics via our smart devices, um, or what, what we like to refer to as a unique verifiable identity. So this is really what's happened very quickly over the past few years. Um, and if you look at the data that supports this, it's pretty amazing. Um, these, this is the uh, evolution of the number of units of biometric smartphones, or the number, I'm sorry, the number of models of biometric smartphones that have been introduced quarterly since Q1 2013. Now, most of us think about Q3 uh, or Q4 2013 when, when the first Apple um, biometric phone was released, but there actually a couple, there was a bunch, several other models that were released that year. But if you look at the trajectory of this data, the last quarter of 2016, nearly 200 models of smartphones were introduced with integrated biometrics. So we now have something on the order of about 500 models of smartphones that are currently biometrically enabled. Um, it's pretty staggering. You can go ahead. You know, Max, uh, sorry to jump in, but when I look at, uh, you know, you have to, I, I have to keep reminding myself that this, these are not yearly uh, uh, results. No. These are quarters. And when I look at 2015, third quarter, it, it basically, you know, doubles so quickly in there. It, it's quite remarkable. Yeah. It's, it's really, really, the growth has been staggering. And so what Acuity believes, and we're, I'm still on track for this, this projection, it may be a little bit far off, but initially when this um, analysis was done, it was 2015, and my belief then, and I still believe this, is that by the end of 2018, biometrics are going to be a standard on smartphones as cameras are. The costs are coming down. The, the, the ability to integrate software at almost no cost is, is rapidly evolving. And we're now seeing iris technology integrated. So fundamentally, I think within the next, you know, by the end of 2018, so basically within two years, I believe that every biometric smartphone will be biometrically enabled. And that is just staggering if you think about the fact that, you know, and Peter, you've had this experience, I know, because I've seen you at conferences. You ask how many people are using biometrics on their smartphone, almost everybody raises their hand. Two and a half years ago, that simply wasn't the case. So this, to me, is phenomenal. Now, add to this what is happening globally and what we're going to see profoundly change our world in the next decade is the prol proliferation of smart devices or smart um, de or devices with smart sensors 
not just for consumers, but commercial devices, appliances, vehicles, factories, utility grids. Um, this is going to fundamentally change the dynamics of how we think about biometrics in the marketplace. Go ahead, Peter. So we all are familiar with the concept of uh, PPI. I'm sorry, the slides look a little jumpy to me because they're, 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 they're fairly um, dense because of the graphics. But essentially, what this slide is trying to demonstrate, if you can go back and just run it again, Peter, the idea is we're all familiar with the idea of PII, right? Personally identifiable information. And we have all these devices that are now generating PII. What's going to happen over the next decade is the type of devices that generate that information is going to expand, and we're going to have something that I like to call EPI, or enterprise proprietary information. So everything out there in the world is going to start generating data. There's going to be massive data collection, and basically we are all sitting at the center of that data coll coll collection with our biometrically enabled personal device. So this is really huge, and I think this is what's going to be interesting over the next decade or so, the evolution of how these technologies proliferate and what that means for mobile biometrics. So again, this problem grow, right, we have these smart devices. This is just going to grow exponentially because we are going to see hundreds of millions of devices that are going to be generating volumes of personally identifiable information and enterprise proprietary information. So what does this mean? Go ahead, Peter. Um, all this information has to be managed, stored, mined, whether, if, whether it's internally for an enterprise or whether there's some commercial aspect with consumers, and fundamentally secured. And to me, this is where biometrics comes into play. We are, data is going to, data, for a long time people have been talking about data as the most critical asset, but this is, this is really going to a new level. I spoke at a um, utility conference, a mobile utility conference in the fall, and I was talking to these guys, you know, these people, these are people that are managing electricity grids, uh, pipelines, uh, energy um, infrastructure, and I was talking to these folks and saying within a decade, the most valuable asset you're going to have, the most critical asset you're going to have in your organization is data. And they were all shaking their heads. They are actually getting this stuff, right? So now we have this question of where is the data stored? Is it on site? Is it in the cloud? Is it in a mobile device? Who owns it? Who has access to it? How do you secure it? Who has liability for the security or loss if, it gets, if there's some kind of breach? And, and do you have some kind of non-reputable audit trail? So this, to me, is where the future, the evolution of biometrics is really going to be critically important over the next decade, because I believe that this, um, this global identity revolution that we're in the midst of, right, is not just about controlling our personal information, personally identifiable information collected by commercial enterprises, but also, as I said, enterprises managing their own data and the data of their customers. And it's really interesting because if you're following the news, yesterday uh, in Washington, D.C., um, the Congress decided that we're not entitled to have even the data that is being collected by our Internet service providers protected. So there's fundamental issues um, around what is going to happen with all this information. And I'm hoping, you know, my vision of the future is that we gain control over that via biometrics. Right? So we're looking at basically a fundamental transformation of the relationship between individuals, organizations, and their data. So this is a, coming back to what does this mean in terms of biometric market evolution. This is a chart that I've been using for several years now. And what's important about looking at this chart is understanding, if you look at the upper left corner, we're talking about traditional applications of biometrics, which were military, civil ID, intelligence, lower volume kind of uh, in transaction environments, but higher assurance transaction environments. And this is what we have traditionally thought about for as far as biometrics over the long haul as a marketplace. And what's happening is this is becoming still, it's still a critical part of the market, but it's a smaller part of the market. What's happening is the market is moving um, in the enterprise and consumer realms down towards the lower right-hand corner. And we sort of had a 
had a jump on the consumer market because we had several years ago, as I said, we started seeing the introduction of these mobile devices, which is um, basically our smartphones with biometrics. And that spurred this whole sort of consumer market, you know, how are we going to integrate this stuff? And we're seeing now, you know, financial services organizations all over the world that are fundamentally using, changing by using biometrics to access data. But what's also happening now, which is very interesting, is this technology is being integrated into the enterprise in a mainstream way. So that our personal mobile devices, the technology that we're carrying around in our hands, are becoming the fundamental authentication tool that we are using. Go ahead, next slide, Peter. And what this looks like, basically, is that all these identity credentials, the very, you know, kind of basic ones we've had, up to complex, you know, smart card-based national IDs, are fundamentally going to be transformed, and they are going to also live inside of our devices. And so this really, once again, puts the, the mobile device at the center of this connected world of technology as our personal authentication mechanism. So what I think where we're going with all of this, and then I'll, I'll, I'll um, uh, leave you with this and we can move on to the discussion, is that we're moving sort of from today where, where we're starting to see multiple different, multiple biometrics, multiple types of authentication offered through our, our uh, smartphones. It's becoming basically a standard. As I said, I think by 20, end of 2018, all of our smartphones will have biometrics integrated. We're moving towards the place where we're all trying to get to, which is replacing passwords, which is this huge, you know, huge issue which we've talked about for a long time, the death of passwords, to a place that I like to think of as what I call do-nothing biometrics, and we're seeing this with the next generation of um, technology. Apple's been talking about this with their iPhone 8 coming out, where essentially you pick up the mobile device and it authenticates you without you having to proactively do anything. And, and that, to me, is ne a, a next important step. And then ultimately, where I think we're going with all of this, and I think we're going to start to see this around 2025, we're going to have our secure credentials embedded in our mobile devices. We are going to be able to move through environments, for example, like airports. We're seeing this now where we're doing single token movement through an airport environment. So what we're really moving towards is, is this seamless experience where our mobile device that we're carrying around is the link between that experience and um, our ability to be authenticated and interact with the world around us on, on many, many levels. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Peter. Well, thank you very, Max. As always, very interesting information. And now I'd like to introduce the additional panelists for today. Joining us from Sweden, Patrick Lindeberg, COO, Precise Biometrics. And from the U.S., David Benini, VP of Marketing, Aware Inc., and Santos Razvadaya, Director of Product Management, Knock Knock Lab Inc. First question to our panel. Multimodality is a big trend all over biometrics. But because modality is so ubiquitous and diverse in terms of use, this area is really at the forefront of embracing a multitude of authentication types. How much of this is being driven by demand for user choice? And what sorts of challenges does the shift toward multimodality present to vendors competing in this very active space? And uh, David Benini, could you start us off on this one, please? Hi, absolutely. Good day, everybody. And thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, so user choice is a big one for, for uh, multimodality. Um, it, it's because uh, users get to choose the technology that works best for them, what they feel comfortable with, uh, and it allows them uh, to accommodate different uh, environments, um, you know, whether they're alone or not, or on a noisy bus, uh, or whether their hands are, are sweaty, what have you. Um, the multimodality allows them to, to apply different techniques to, to, to get the job done. Um, but there's a lot of other reasons why you might, might do it. Um, one is that it allows you to grant you some flexibility to meet custom uh, requirements in terms of security versus convenience. So now I can use different modalities uh, based on what my requirements might be uh, in regards to security versus convenience. Uh, it allows us to have less reliance on a single supplier or a single technology 
We can also boost performance uh, by applying fusion. Um, the diversity of these modalities makes them really complementary. Uh, so you can achieve a higher level of security and also add barriers, additional barriers to spoofing. Um, and, you know, FIDO standards are an example of how I, I expect this multimodality to really be realized. It essentially creates a marketplace for authenticators. So I think that's um, it's going to be a real uh, a big driver in, in, uh, in uh, realizing multimodality on devices. Some challenges. Uh, liveness detection, you know, really our, 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 our functionality is, it tends to be as strong as our weakest link if we allow somebody to use a particular modality. Um, each one of them has to be uh, working well. Uh, and I think we're going to get into that in more depth uh, as we go here. But uh, convenience, making it convenient for users, uh, allowing uh, efficient capture and fast verification times. The footprint, the size of the app, it's complex algorithms, they take up space. So keeping the, the size of the footprint on the device down. Security of server-side um, functions. Uh, a big challenge for vendors is the diversity of devices and how quickly they're evolving. We've got many different types of devices, as Maxine mentioned, different sensors, different operating systems, and also a diversity of needs geographically and, and by application. So uh, it's a big challenge, but progress is being made really quickly. Thanks, David. And, and Santosh, can I get your take on this question, please? Absolutely, Peter. So at Knock Knock Labs, uh, what we believe is the right authenticator for any use case is a factor of three things. First is the usability desired, as, as Peter also mentioned earlier, as, as David also mentioned earlier. Whether this use case is meant for a factory worker on the floor or whether it is meant for somebody who is driving their car. So that's the usability factor. The second factor I would say is the security profile and the risk desired in that use case whether it's a low-risk use case or a high-risk high, high risk use case, for example, a $10,000 money transfer transaction. So that's the security profile and, and the risk. And the third factor is the economics associated with that use case. Uh, so, for example, many of, uh, many of uh, the customer profit or ARPUs kind of set in, in like less than $5, uh, you know, per, per, per year. And in certain, in those cases, you are not going to deploy uh, uh, authenticators such as such as tokens. So essentially, as I said, uh, you know, the choice of of uh, modality depends on on these three factors: usability, security profile, and the risk, as well as the economics of that use case. The basic challenge with with multi-modality is really like buying toasters and microwaves. And, and any other appliances without having any wiring or places to plug in those appliances. So what happens is each mode comes with its own special wiring that you have to run all the way to the electric pole to use that appliance. And following this approach in biometric implementation creates complexity and cost for IT and developer. As you know, I would point out David again, as he mentioned that, that there is FIDO standards and the FIDO protocols allow you to, to plug in any method of authentication while keeping the developer API and backend the same, which is like, like the comfort you have when you can simply plug in your any appliance in your house because the wiring, the plug, and the interconnects are all standard. Uh, there's another challenge, which is, you know, even, even though you could use strong modes of authentication, you could use multi-modality, but you know they are prone to phishing. Uh, again, uh, FIDO here provides beyond pluggability uh, strong binding from authenticator to the cloud to to prevent scalable attacks uh, like phishing. So so those are those are some some of the very uh, uh, you know high value uh, advantages of FIDO that that you know, that provides in case of multi modality. Thank you, you very much, Santosh. About... Uh, and we're going to move on to the next question. Now that biometrics mm -hmm. have become standard issue on smartphones, it's becoming apparent that the next frontier for mobile authentication is, as we heard just uh, previously, liveness detection. Um, in, in this space where scalable multi-factor authentication is becoming so accessible, what is driving the demand for liveness detection, and what are some of the challenges bringing this to uh, mobility. And Patrick, can I ask you to start on this one, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Peter. Very interesting questions. Um, 
We at Precise Biometrics, uh, we are seeing a shift towards security in the mobile biometric industry. Um, when fingerprint sensors started to be integrated into to mobile devices, it was mainly about uh, convenience to, to open the phone, basically, and as a new and cool feature. Nowadays, uh, payment providers, uh, mobile vendors, and other players are focusing on security and also on fraud mitigation. So the main driver right now, as we see it, is, is uh, mobile payment, and, and that will drive a demand for liveness uh, detection. Um, current state, uh, of liveness detection, I would say, um, especially talking about fingerprint sensor, which is my field, is that most sensors don't have spoof, spoof detection capability, at least not implemented in, in real devices. There are a few devices claiming to have liveness detection, but uh, at which performance level is, is really hard to say, as we're lacking industry standards or common metrics for performance evaluation in this field. Uh, this together makes the, the sensor sensitive to uh, spoofing via fake fingers, and especially if it's sensitive operations that are to be performed. So the biggest challenges to, to overcome this, I, I would say, is uh, that there, there will always be a con uh, consequence when you want to increase security, as you do with, with liveness detection. Uh, as more processing is required, it will have an impact on, on the latency, also, you will make some false reacts as you process, uh, for example, a fingerprint. So in other words, there will be uh, a, a higher false reaction rate uh, when, you, when you add liveness detection. Flip side, of course, being that you will gain higher security. And for, for relevant use cases, you will be willing to accept this so-called penalty in terms of la latency and false reaction rates. For example, going back to, to payment-related uh, use cases, financial transactions, and, and such. But maybe not for unlocking your, your phone, which you typically do several times every hour. Uh, that might not be too critical at, at this stage. Um, another check. Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks, Patrick. And uh, David uh, Benini, you mentioned this uh, liveness detection. Can I get uh, your, your thoughts on, on this particular area? Sure. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, AWARE spends quite a bit of time on addressing uh, liveness detection for facial recognition on mobile, and it is challenging. The ubiquity of, of facial images makes them uh, potentially more vulnerable to spoofing attacks. So what we see is uh, a, a need to uh, address specific attacks, uh, whether they be with a photo or a video or, and other, other dip various attack modes. And you really have to address them with different algorithms, and that's and that's what we're doing. Um, and the challenges there are again getting this stuff to run on a phone, uh, keeping up with the different devices and the and the uh, diversity of devices. These algorithms evolve over time; they're they're difficult uh, to design, and uh, they take time. They they um, and they also rely on lots of data to to develop. So as we get our hands on more data, our, our algorithms are improving. We also have new technologies that are, are coming out, um, in, uh, deep learning types of things that are also assisting in the task. Thank you very much, David. The next question, mobility is evolving beyond the handset. Artificial intelligence, wearable tech, Internet of Things, connected cars, robotics, AR, VR, and I could go on and on. What are the opportunities you are seeing for biometrics now that the mobile landscape is expanding in terms of use cases? Again, what are the challenges inherent in serving such a quickly changing space? And are there specific new technologies that are particularly appropriate, appropriate for biometric integration? And, and uh, David Pollington, I'm going to ask you to start off on this one, having just you know come from the the Mobile World Congress show in Barcelona, we saw a lot of this activity. Can I get your thoughts on this one, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so I think as, as we've already touched on um, already within this webinar, there's going to be multiple different modes of um, the way in which the user authenticates themselves to a particular service. And especially when we start to look at different devices, there'll be different authentication modalities that make sense within the context of those different devices. Um, and certainly, we've seen wearables which are dedicated to authentication, like the Nike bracelet um, based on the heartbeat. Um, but there's going to be a bunch of wearables 
that are going to be um, able to authenticate you through passive monitoring of the fact that you've still got that smartwatch on your wrist and you've already authenticated um, in a previous session. Um, but the other interesting thing is that as your personal area network of different devices expands, and this includes your car, you know, your, your Wi-Fi hotspot at home, your wearables, etc. Effectively, you can start using all of these different touch points as a means of passively monitoring in terms of whether or not this is still the user within a safe environment um, and you know, in close proximity to devices that are known to be associated with that user. And that then becomes very powerful in this kind of multimodal um, aspect in terms of really having that confidence that it is still the correct person. So I think you know, the, as we see more devices proliferate, I think that's just going to give us a lot more opportunity to actually gain the confidence that we need through multiple touch points instead of having to rely on um, a single modality. So it should be very interesting. Thanks, David. And, and Santosh, can I uh, get your opinion on this question, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Peter. So, uh, Peter, when we talked about multimodality, I had mentioned that really the right authenticator for any given uh, use case is a factor of three things. Is the usability, is the security desired, and it's economics associated to that use case. So obviously all of these new use cases that you mentioned here that are emerging, whether it's IoT, connected cars, connected homes, these sort of use cases are all going to be wonderful use cases, in my opinion, where biometrics can be leveraged. What we are going to see is we are going to go through an experimentation phase to understand which of the modalities best meet the three criteria that I have laid out. Also, what, what we believe is uh, the biometrics that, are, that we are used to seeing today will not continue in the same shape and form that, that we see them today. We're already seeing the integration of biometrics into dedicated devices such as wearables. Uh, so you have a choice. Uh, for example, whether you want to integrate a fingerprint sensor into a car or, or into a key fob. And these are all open questions, in, in my opinion, that will go through some experimentation uh, to, to understand. It might be that, that you know, a bracelet uh, that, that understands your, your cardiac rhythm may be an interesting way to interact with your smart home device, your, your connected home devices. And, you know, some of these questions, we will, we will see some, some answers emerging, and, and we'll, see, we'll start to see some, some strong usage patterns uh, emerging in these areas in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Thank you very much, Santos. Max, I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on this question. What are the opportunities and some of the challenges as all these new evolving areas start? Well, one of the things that I think is really interesting, and this dovetails on what um, gentlemen, gentlemen were just saying, and also this whole concept of the proliferation of smart sensors and and data. I think what's going to be really interesting is managing how much of the, the biometric information and the authentication is going to occur on our device. And we have seen FIDO, for example, come up with a whole standard um, uh, to use a device-centric authentication model that is being widely um, adopted, and I think that's terrific. But I also believe that there's opportunities for the authentication to be happening in a cloud-based environment. And we've seen products introduced into the market that can now integrate within, for example, an enterprise environment where you can do cloud-based authentication using your mobile device as the reader, the capture device. So I think it's going to be very interesting to try to understand where the data lives, where the authentication takes place locally on device, or in the cloud, some combination of the boat of both, and how that's managed in terms of the relative risk or liability of a particular um, type of authentication, and that may directly impact or be influence the modality that's being used and the level of liveness detection and some of these other issues that we've talked about. Thanks, Max. Uh, next question, we're on the verge of a major step forward in network infrastructure with commercial 5G networks only a few years away. Can biometrics find an integral place in the next generation of connectivity? This is, a, this is big. Patrick, could I ask you to start on this question, please? Yes. Um, 
as I see it, 5G will uh, enable IoT to a much larger extent than, than we see today. And for sure, some of the IoT use cases will demand uh, strong and easy authentication. So using biometrics and, and potentially in combination, as, as Maxine uh, described before, uh, I think that will be a natural step as we move into, into 5G. And, and David Pollington, um, you know, for, for those uh, uh, attendees who are not terribly familiar with the timing around 5G, could you maybe just give us a sense of, of what's happening there and how fast this is all coming? Yeah, I mean, it's really starting to speed up now. There's, there's been a lot of activity over the past few years, um, but the standards bodies are really now targeting to get first implementations out, I think, in the 2020 timeframe. Uh, that might seem a long way away, but time flies fast. Um, and as Patrick says, you know, one of the, the key um, areas where 5G is really going to come to the fore is, is as we see this plethora of new devices um, that are going to need connectivity. Um, and the, the speed of bandwidth and the latency will really drive a lot of the use cases around these different devices. So I think, you know, when you look at the ramp up of IoT, when you look up, when you look at the introduction of these 5G networks coming in in a few years' time, um, the necessity to be able to manage these devices and the identity of these devices and be able to authorize um, how data on these devices is used, uh, it's just going to become paramount. So, you know, I think we're seeing a perfect storm of everything coming together over the next two or three years. You know, you know, David, it's very interesting. I remember hearing back a couple of years ago at the Mobile World Congress that 5G was still a long way off. Then last year it seemed like that all became compressed, and then this year we heard that it's going to be used at the uh, the Olympics coming up in the, uh, in the next Winter Olympics. So it just seems to be getting faster and faster, and, and it's a critical uh, area for autonomous vehicles, as you mentioned, and, and other things where increased connectivity is, is required for these things to really take hold. So thank you very much for those comments. Next question, payments were the major use case for mobile biometrics for a long time and played a major role in bringing strong authentication into the mainstream. Now mobile biometrics are becoming ubiquitous enough that other vertical markets are catching up. What is the next market to watch for mobile biometrics? And will we ever see anything like the boom we saw in fintech uh, coming ahead? And um, Max, can I ask you to start in this one, please? Boy, um, <laughs> as I said, I mean, I think a lot of this is really going to be wrapped around um, IoT and how we um, manage and protect our PII. So what this means to me is that we're going to start to see shifting business models. And again, um, this is why I was so concerned by the, the law that apparently is going to be passed in the U.S. about basically giving ISPs to total control of our personal browsing history and allowing them to monetize that information. Um, I think one of the, the tenets that's central to allow biometrics to thrive is to not allow people to monetize information and actually to make sure that the biometric data in particular is authentic, is uh, stored in a way that, that is safe and that is not, um, does not allow that personal, personal information to be divulged. So I think one of the things that's going to happen is we're going to see the evolution of um, third-party biometric authentication services. And I think that's going to fundamentally change the market, and it's going to open up biometrics to every kind of application you can imagine because your information, the biometric authentication, is going to be distinct from the individual organization that you're working with. In other words, we're going to move from Total, we're still going to have the mobile device as the center of, of authentication, but it's not simply going to be um, what we're seeing now with financial services, which is accessing account or logging on logging onto your account, maybe uh, well, an, an additional authentication for a transaction. I think it's going to be much more integrated in a way that, um, as I said, we're going to sort of see this seamless authentication methodology happening when we're in retail spaces, when we're operating in, in digital spaces. And um, I, I think what we're going to see is more of this evolution of an infrastructure to support a range of applications rather than it be driven by a specific type of application. 
If that Thank makes you, sense. Max. Max and, and uh, David Benini, can I uh, get your opinion on what you think the next big market for mobile biometrics is? Sure. So, you know, so biometrics are essentially an identity technology, as we know, and really biometrics can find their way into any application that requires uh, identity. So. The more near-term stuff is, is anywhere there's passwords, uh, anywhere we're using physical keys, uh, physical access, homes, hotels, cars, wherever we use ID cards. You know, I think a big one is digital identity, where you know we're getting rid of passwords right now. We we expect, but w what might be next? Well, you could imagine that uh, having our name and our address written down on something just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, and that could all be. Um, done perhaps more effectively using a unique identifier and a biometric. Um, so basically, wherever you see fraud or theft, I mean, you're going to see biometrics. An area that I think is is interesting and, and evolving quickly is this idea of no no. And I think Maxine touched on it a bit, which is know your customer, know your what I call KYX, know your customer, know your employee, know your citizen. Um, you know, we can use that that biometric data much more effectively as an authentication tool if we can trust that it was was collected accurately uh, and and the person that it's representing did so uh, honestly um, so that's an area that I think will will evolve quickly and we're seeing that already thanks David Patrick can I get your thoughts on this one please absolutely and um, uh, one trend that we are seeing and, and trying to be part of is, is wearables with a fingerprint sensor that are enabling contactless payments uh, also including a secure element for, for the payment re related operations. So this is something I believe we will see in the marketplace by uh, hopefully by the end of this year or, or beginning of next year. Uh, another thing uh, that's been on the radar for quite some time now is smart cards or credit cards with fingerprint uh, mm -hmm. sensors. and. Uh, Hopefully, we will see at least some full-scale, real-life pilots kicking off uh, during this year. Well, there, there's a market that just uh, came out of, well, not nowhere, but boy, it, it moved fast. A year ago, uh, in this past year, just tremendous growth in that, in that particular smart, smart card area. Mm -hmm. Santosh, can I get your thoughts on this, please? What's the next Absolutely. hot vertical Thank market? Thank you, Peter. Yeah, so I would I would pretty much agree with what uh, what David and Patrick have uh, said before, and what what we think at Knock Knock is it is less about a specific vertical than it is about use cases. So there are simple use cases, and there then there are some advanced use cases that are emerging. In terms of simple use cases, things like you know access to a cloud hosted service, access to customer service portal. And that holds true whether you are a mobile network operator, a healthcare company, or a bank. And what we are likely to see is an acceleration in, in, in the use of biometric across those verticals. There are also advanced use cases, uh, uh, you know, things like Internet of Things, such as a connected car, connected home. And because IoT is not just about machine-to-machine -machine security, and there are human beings that either use those devices or manage those devices, they're, they will need to be authenticated. Those human beings need to be authenticated for those IoT use cases as well. And that will have to be something other than username and password to avoid a situation we had with, uh, with Mirai botnet kind of attacks. So what, what we'll see is an inflection point in the, in the marketplace in the next 24 months where each of, each of these use cases are going to penetrate multiple verticals simultaneously. While we'll also see some of these advanced use cases, uh, the, the IoT use cases that we talked about make some progress uh, in, in, this, in this time. Thanks, Santosh. And, and David Pollington, you, you see a lot in, in your role uh, with the GSMA. What do you think the next hot vertical market might be? I, you know, I think the interesting thing is, you know, we've touched on the use of biometrics. Typically on mobile devices, it's all about authenticating the user to the device to authorize a payment transaction or to give them access to the device. Um, I think the next big thing is really going to be about the real identity of the user and how that is actually then presented to any kind of relying party. Uh, there's lots of different verticals, uh, whether either regulated um, or just in order to transact with the individual. They just need to know that this is a real person and perhaps they need to know the identity of who that person is. So I think those kind of non-repudiation aspects of not only did this guy authenticate, but this guy is David and we can prove that it's David. 
I think is going to be the interesting thing that's going to come into this. And obviously, um, from a privacy perspective, people want to still be able to transact anonymously, uh, and that needs to be respected. But I think that role of biometrics for actually helping to identify the real person behind a transaction, uh, where that's needed based on the use case, is something that we're going to increasingly see is becoming important um, to, to safeguard the security of the web. Thank you, David. And I'm going to give my two cents here. The, 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 the next market, vertical market, that I think is going to be super hot is healthcare. That's my prediction, and I'm sticking to it. Um, now, we're getting a lot of questions from the attendees, and I'm going to try and shift to a couple of these. We're getting a lot of questions about uh, privacy, uh, as, as David had just mentioned, uh, and, and about you know when will the password finally be gone. So uh, maybe to put that into one question, you know, uh, it looks like we're getting close to doing away with passwords. Uh, and, and what what do end users need to know about privacy? And Max, I think you've talked about the data storage and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, maybe just a couple of quick comments about when will the password be gone and where does privacy fit into all this? And Max, I'm actually going to ask you to start on this one, please. Okay, so I really think that we're going to start to see in the next two years um, what I call hardened biometrics on mobile devices. And what I would argue today is that the vast majority of biometric authentication that exists on mobile devices is for facilitation. It's for ease of use. It's not so much for security. So what I think we're going to see in the next two years is we're going to see the evolution towards hardened uh, biometrics, whether it's fingerprint, whether it's iris. We're going to see people saying, okay, the fundamental security model on the mobile device is biometrics. When that happens, that's when we're really going to start to see the death of passwords. So I say we see the next two years where we see hardened technology, the next three to five where we really start to see people be confident and comfortable replacing their reliance on passwords with biometrics. As far as privacy goes, this, again, is a really hot issue for me, and I really believe fundamentally that the model should be that as individuals we own our PII, that access to that PII, whether it is biometric information or whether it's any other kind of biographic information or even behavioral information, should be owned and controlled by the individual. So I think what's critically important is the evolution of these models that allow for third-party authenticators that that basically are the organizations that then take the, the responsibility and the liability for ensuring that an individual who is engaged in a transaction is in fact the individual has the right to do that. And separating the, the identity information from the transaction, I think is going to begin to really help improve um, the privacy that we experience and it's really going to shift the monetization model in a way that that says to companies trying to make money off our personal data is that you can't do that unless I give you permission. And that, I think, is going to be a fundamental shift, and we're going to see that happen and evolve over the next three to five years as well. Thanks, Max. And it's interesting. I'm looking at all the questions we're getting in. A lot of them have to do with this privacy, the data, security, uh, uh, and, and when will the password actually go. So Patrick, can I just get a weigh in on this, please? Yeah, and I think I'm I'm very, very well aligned with with Maxine and what she said. We we strongly believe, and actually we've done from from the very origin of the company, that uh, you should be in possession of your own biometric credentials, and that they of course should be stored in a secure environment as well. But not only that, the the matching itself should also be done in this same uh, secure environment um, in in your own device and. A few examples of that being the, the mobile phone where more or less all implementations now are done within the trusted execution environment, uh, the TE. Uh, I mentioned credit card before with a fingerprint sensor that we have a secure element holding the, the, the template but also, also executing the, the operations. And we see uh, notebooks, um, similar story where, for example, the Intel SGX security ar architecture is been, been put into our piece, uh, basically from all, all the, the major OEMs right now. So um, 
yeah, we, we believe you should you should own your um, uh, biometric credentials and they should be executed within your position. Thank you, Patrick. David Benini, please uh, weigh in on this one as well. Sure. I think one of the challenges here is that most people don't uh, necessarily differentiate between biometric authentication and biometric search. Um, and I think in terms of perception, the authentication uh, tends to get some collateral damage from the privacy issues associated with search, which is a, arguably a different technology. Um, some of the recent issues that are bringing this issue uh, to the top, things like uh, Fine Face we've heard about in Russia and, and this Facesam hoax app, which was essentially allowing you to take a photograph and find that person in social media, either on Twitter or, or, or some Facebook-like app. Mm. So those are, those are, I think, the, the big um, issues where, the big, the big areas where biometrics uh, gets a bad rap. And th those are very different from authentication and hopefully over time people will differentiate between those two. But I think that's, those types of activities are what are going to drive some, some privacy legislation. And, and you know, the legislation is, is catching up with the technology at this point. Um, uh, and and that's, that's, that's one of the major factors that we see is, you know, authentication tends to get a bad rap because of some of these other um, applications that get a lot of attention but aren't necessarily related whatsoever to authentication. Thanks, David. And Santosh, uh, your, your thoughts, please. Sure. Uh, so I believe, I think we, we all here agree that, uh, that client-side biometrics, in terms of data privacy, uh, client-side biometrics are much more stronger than a server-side implementation, which needs to be held to a much higher standards because on the server side, you store a lot, lot of templates, large number of templates, and, and the matching storage is done on the server side, which, which exposes those templates uh, to, to attackers. Whereas on the client side biometrics, you, you make the job harder for the attacker by distributing these secrets onto individual devices. So the job there is to protect against an automated scalable attack that might be able to access the biometric data or, or cryptographic secrets. And, and as, as we discussed earlier, that this very typically means that this means taking advantage of mechanisms like ARM Trust Zone, Intel SGX, and, and other secure elements uh, of hardware uh, security that can increase the security profile of the implementation. David, I also wanted to, uh, sorry, Peter, I also wanted to comment on, uh, on, a, uh, on, you know, how will we get rid of passwords going forward? And what we believe at Knock Knock is there are certain barriers uh, to this post-password future. And the number one barrier today is a lack of understanding on the part of relying parties. Uh, you know, what, what, they, what they are surprised to learn is that biometrics has a probabilistic matching mechanism that is tuned for particular implementation to achieve a certain threshold for false acceptance and false rejects. And when they get concerned about this, we like to point out that probability of someone sharing a password or a pen or a smart card has never been quantified. And on the biometric side, you have quantification of, of these uh, false acceptance and false rejects. So they should consider it to be a robust and reliable instead of being concerned, concerned about it. So well, that's, thank you that's very, one of Thank the, you very much, Santosh. Uh, uh, we're gonna have to, to call it there. Uh, uh, thank you, panel. That was well, was just fantastic. Uh, make sure to join us on April 29th uh, for our next webinar, Continuous Identity, Why Behavioral Biometrics Are Going Mainstream. This is a really strong growth area. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Aware, Precise, and Knock Knock for their continued support, and especially to Max from Acuity Market Intelligence for her expert analysis today, and to David Paulington for the Hot from Barcelona Mobile Connect update. This concludes our webinar today. Have a good day, all.